This week of the Sports Initiative podcast is a collaborative episode with the Rugby Coach Weekly. We sit down with Phil Llewellyn and David Kilcoin to discuss a wide range of topics and lessons taken from recently discovered content. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Rugby Coach Weekly Roundup Radio. I'm your host, Phil Llewellyn. Thank you for joining us for Season 5, where we are discussing all things coaching. My guests are going to present their key learnings for a piece of content of their choosing, and we then discuss its application. Two excellent guests join me this week, so I'll hand over to them to introduce themselves. Morning, guys. So, first of all, my name is Michael Wright. Um, I work for Southampton Football Club. Um, I've worked there for probably almost a decade now, both in the coaching and recruitment department and uh, really excited to share some learnings and probably learn a little bit from rugby as well, which should be interesting for me. Hi guys, uh, I'm Dave Kilcoyne. I'm head of rugby um, at Desborough College in Maidenhead. Um, I'm a massive Southampton fan. Um, incidentally, I can't wait to ask Michael why uh, Taylor isn't starting every week. But no, um, coach rugby for since I was about 18. Um, and couple that in with my teaching responsibilities as well. Fantastic. Absolute pleasure to have you both on. Really do appreciate it. Uh, just before we get going, just a reminder to check out the blurb on Rugby Coach Weekly for links to the content that we discuss and other resources. Uh, Michael, we are coming over to you first. What are you going to talk to us about? Perfect. So I'm going to go a little bit of a blast from the past. So it, this was released on Netflix in 2020. Um, the series is called The Playbook. Um, essentially, it's, um, I think, five or six coaches basically just talking about different rules that they have in order to have high performance cultures. So you've got Jose Mourinho on there, um, Doc Rivers, the basketball coach. And the individual I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to absolutely butcher his last name, so apologies if this is wrong, is Patrick Moratogolu or something along those lines. So essentially, he's a tennis coach who... Um, worked with Serena Williams, uh, as well as some other um, well-known players like Marcos, Bagdatis, and et cetera. Um, and I think one of the things that really resonated with me um, around this area was his discussion around um, tennis players tanking. Um, I think we've all seen videos of Nick Kyrgios, uh, the, the Aussie player who at times is trying to drop, drop shots from the back of the court or maybe not given what many would perceive as best effort. Um, And basically, Patrick had a theory on this, which is generally the most talented players are the ones that enact this and and tank in this way. Um, And his theory around this is that basically all the way through their pathway, they've been known as talented, and that's how they've been described and labelled by obviously external people but also themselves so when they then begin to find and see adversity at the top level um, and that talent isn't perceived enough they have nothing they they have no coping strategies to fall back on so the way that they cope with this is to give a lack of effort so that's almost a, a parachute for them to say well actually it wasn't my talent that let me down on that day it was me not trying It was me not conducting myself in the right manner. Um, And the reason it resonated so much with me, I guess, is just because I think we've all seen players like that. We've all seen players at the top level where you go, if he could just get it together, you know, he's got all the attributes. As a Tottenham fan at the moment, I look at Tangai and Dembele. I mean, he's a perfect example of this. You say if he could get everything together, he probably wouldn't be with us. Um, And I think it's just a really interesting conversation to be had around how do we just support and challenge what we consider the talented players in the group or the naturally gifted players in your group that you work with and what does that actually look like? Um, Because I think maybe a a change of terminology with them in the development pathway as well as how you manage them at top end, you might see some real positive uh, adaptations in those types of behaviors where you don't see people just giving up or giving lack of effort when things begin to go poorly 
Um, so yeah, that's the piece that I've seen. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that series or have any thoughts on it. Fantastic, thank you very much. I, yeah, I've definitely seen the series. Actually, one of those I just didn't see that one. So this is a this is a great follow up. Um, guys, bear me two seconds. Sorry, that's all good. Sorry, someone just come into the uh, the pavilion. Um, yes, no, have have seen the series, but didn't actually get to watch that one. So that's a that's a a, a really nice follow up. I guess kind of first question is, how much do you think it's an ego protection thing? Is you know, if, as you say, taking away and making it around a lack of effort rather than a lack of skill or ability or application almost, do you think that's the ego just protecting that individual and kind of going, we can fob this off and come away with our, um, basically, yeah, ego still intact without it being too too much of a deficit later on? Yeah, I, I think it massively is around that. I, I think that it is protecting them and kind of going, if talent's all they've ever had so if they don't have any other identity or they haven't really had to work maybe as hard as some other individuals to increase elements of their game then I would say this probably is a point where they go well actually my, my talent alone now isn't enough and we haven't created the scaffolding for them to deal with adversity so we haven't created bumps in the road for them we talk about the rocky road approach haven't created any bumps in the road for them to give those other strategies um so i'd say that definitely is is a protection of the ego um and the, the reason as i said it just fascinates me is because i think we've all seen them i know in my working with kids we've seen those that when things start going wrong the arms go up in the air or the body language changes that the shoulders slump etc um and they're probably the players that you you know you always kind of want to go come on like if you just get over it you'll be you'll be the one that can turn it around for us but I think it's fascinating how yeah them probably always having success naturally challenges their ego and then what that means when they get into really really challenging situations it's really weird like, I see it all the time in the school environment so like whether I'm teaching practically or whether I'm teaching my theory group like I've just inherited so we do a two-year GCC at my school so I've just literally inherited my new class of year 10s. And they're, they're a nice bunch of kids um, for BTEC Sport. And I've got, it's a really weird, I've never had it like this before quite as much. So I've got, there's about four names that have shot into my head immediately of kids that are bright, but they don't want to fail, if that makes sense. Like you ask them in, so I'll give them some new information. We're doing the skeletal system at the moment. And I'll give them some new information, which I know they haven't learned before. And then you just want them to have a go. And about three quarters of the room will quite happily just have a go, knowing that they'll forget the name of this bone and they'll forget the name of this and they'll forget the name. There's about four kids that just want the answer. They don't want their book or their bit of paper, or whatever it is, to end up with red ink of mine on it with a cross. They just don't want to see it. And it ties in a little bit because they then those four kids they're not trouble trouble making kids at all they're, they're really nice young men but they then try and fob it off as oh if I'm a little bit chatty now so it's going to concentrate on the fact that I'm chatting to my mate and distracting him rather than the fact that I'm not doing any work and it's I've never seen it quite as profoundly as this group of year 10s so I probably have and just not really picked up on it but it's like, and it, it probably is just an ego protection thing because they're four bright kids. They're going to leave school with some decent results behind them. They're decent athletes to go with it. And they are literally, they just don't want to be stung almost in front of their mates. In front, They don't want to stick their hand up and get it wrong. And then I have to say, look, you're slightly wrong or correct this or whatever. And it is all just ego protection. And in an all boys environment that I teach in, where there's testosterone flying around, they're 15, they're all growing, they're all hitting puberty and all this sort of stuff. It's so, it's almost funny to observe when you take yourself a step away from it a little bit. And then you've got the kids who perhaps were early developers who have gone through that and they've stopped. They've kind of got over that stage of their life where they just throw themselves into it. Um, and they don't mind sticking their hand up and they don't mind making a mistake or whatever. And then you tie it in and it, it goes on to a football pitch, a rugby pitch all at the same time. It's really, really interesting to observe in teenagers from a teaching perspective. 
Yeah, I, I had some theories on this last night of how I'd maybe challenge it moving forward. I guess with you working in the school, is there any particular strategies you use or have used that you've seen benefits in this area? Uh, more so in coaching, actually, if I'm being honest. It's something that I'm still working on in my theory teaching. I think practically teaching, I've got it better than where I did when I started my teaching career five years ago. Um, you know, you can tailor lessons and you can tailor training sessions. So you sort of, you set them up to fail almost, but in a really protected environment. So like my year 11 team, for example, on Thursday evening, lost their first rugby game in a long time. This team don't normally lose. And you could just see it. It was a really tight game. It was a horrible day. I'm still drying out. Like we went 7-0 down with about 15 minutes to go and you could just see the team capitulate because they're not used to it. And then I was thinking about something that maybe I should have brought in a bit earlier was that you almost want them to fail in training where it's safe. Like you almost want them to set up maybe a scenario where they are, you know, they're going to fail. You know, they're not going to quite achieve it. Um, and in a team environment, that's quite hard because I've got two or three really talented lads in that group who will go on and play at a good level wherever that may be. Um, and even they just looked flustered on Thursday. As soon as the team started losing, even those three, like you sort of said, you just sort of wanted one of those three to grab the game by the scruff of the neck and they would have been fine. But because they're not used to going 7-0 down with 15 minutes to go, they just capitulated. And yeah, you, you could, and it, it ties into a classroom a little bit. Um, but I think where I am on the start of this course in my year 10s, because they are right at the start, you need that. And this is kind of what I'm going to tie into with what I talk about. You need that instant success first. So it's a really hard balance at the moment because you want, you need to get them hooked with the instant success. Like imagine when you first buy a PlayStation game, level one's always really easy because the game wants you to succeed first because then you're hooked. It's that kind of thought process. Um, but yeah, with the year 11s, I certainly could have sprinkled in a bit more failure first. With year 10, I'm in that delicate stage where I need them to succeed. But I need them to succeed, not me give them the answer. And that's a really delicate balance at the moment. How much is this about looping them in on that process? And I've talked about this before, and the analogy I often use is the Wizard of Oz in, in terms of the wizard behind the curtain. Like, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's an illusion. But actually, like we need at some point, we need to to let the players in on there's a mechanism and a, and a process here to challenge you to ensure that you do start to learn how to fail, but in a really supported manner, and that you learn to be, you know, you you learn what uncomfortable feels like in in whatever environment that is. Do do you think we can do that by just being ourselves and being the coach and and kind of? I guess, playing the role that we are meant to play within that space? Or do we actually have to just sit that sit them down and go, look, you know, how are you feeling about this? Do you feel, or ask all those types of questions on getting them to recognise that maybe they're not comfortable with failure and that they hide from it and start with that kind of self-awareness piece first and then build from there? Or, or can we kind of manipulate in a positive way externally almost? I, th I think it's probably and this is massively sitting on the fence, but a bit of both. Um, I, th I think that you as a coach can probably design sessions or design lessons to really incorporate it. So as, as David just said there, we can give them a bit of success at the start to get them hooked in, um, to get them on board with your ideas or how you want to play or how you're going to coach them. And then we can start ramping up the challenge from there. Um, and I think obviously identifying where the players in your group are and uh, challenging them appropriately is, is important there. So if, if you have got a top four or five players in your group, then that might be the opportunity to separate them off with a particular practice. So, you know, if rugby example, if you've got four or five lads who are really good at drop goals off their dominant foot and the rest of the class or group aren't, OK, well, let's get the rest of the class and group to do it from varying distances and various angles on their dominant foot, whilst these five are going to do it on their non-dominant. It, it provides suitable challenge for everyone, but they're going to get some success and some failure. One thing we do do at Southampton, which is we've seen real benefits with, is a lot of I, IDP work, so individual development plan work. Um, and you would have seen it floating around. We use like FIFA 
card style stuff and um it's been great what we what we're able to do with them and the the way we're able to incorporate kind of s and c and um performance analysis psychology all that type of stuff is really really good but i think one of the things it has done it has allowed you to have conversations with players um to say well what do you think so i've got a load of clips here where you're not fully engaged or you're not um acting in the Southampton way or the principles that you said you're going to at the start of the season what can we do to help you with it and you get their buying because they're almost telling you what they want or what they need now again that is a balancing act because as a player if you told me what do I always need well I just need an arm around my shoulder and tell me how great I am which isn't always the, the best answer um but we have seen some benefits in that and I'd say for me as a, as a coach and practitioner in terms of my language, the bit that I thought of is really emphasizing they've developed and learned the skills that they have. So they would have had failure along the way. So rather than going, listen, you're really good at, uh, in a football context, you're really good at being players 1v1, change that language to you've developed the skill to beat someone 1v1. Because the minute you use the word developed or you've learned, we're then focusing on the fact there was a process to get to that point. So you would have had times where you would have failed. You would have had opportunities where you would have got bashed around, be that at the park or in training. So actually all we're doing is just changing the terminology. So rather than just saying, well, you're good at that, you must have always been good at that and not giving them the opportunity to realise that actually I've de developed that skill. So now we're going to ask you to develop another one or we're going to put you in another situation where you're going to develop it again. Um, so for me, when I, when I watched that video back and stuff, I thought that was a really big one. Talk to them around. I'm here to help you and enable you, but you've developed these skills to get you to the point where you have a lot of success. So now we're just going to develop these last few traits or character traits or whatnot, the same as you've done those one and give them like a, framework and example that they have had success in this in the past yeah i agree completely it's it's all about yours you almost see, need to make the players see that there's a journey behind it um i think rugby falls into a trap almost still it's getting less so but still of you know if you're the biggest kid at 12 the age 12 you're you're, you're perceived as this almost talented rugby player just because you've hit puberty earlier. You know, and I've got an example in year seven. He's a lovely young man, but he's just huge. Like, and he's he's not a bad player. But I remember, like, he rocked up to the first year seven training session and he was obviously going to be up there. But as soon as I said to him, you know, I changed the rules. We played a game at the end um, and I changed the rules around him. I said, you're no longer contact. If you're touched, it's an instant turnover panic in his eyes because he was like what I have to pass the ball and it was like yeah <laughs> and but actually over the year my plan with this particular young man is just uh, I'll do that most training sessions and it, it will look like I'm almost picking on him but I'm not I just want him to th have another string to his bow and I assume you see this at Southampton a lot is that and it's a message I put across to boys an awful lot it's not about being the best 12 year old if you want to make it, it's about being the best 18, 19, 20 year old when they're dishing the contracts out. And it, it's, and you know, you're also saying that on the flip side of that in rugby, you're saying that to the, the 12 year old who's two feet tall and half a stone and he's saturated. You know, technically, you're probably better than a lot of these bigger guys. But unfortunately, at the moment, you can't access that bashing three people off, which is what all the parents clap about. But actually, what you do around the pitch is as important. You know, you're distributing the ball much, much better. Your kicking games had to develop earlier. Your agility has come on much earlier than these boys have because it's had to. Um, so when you do have your growth spurt and when you do put your weight on, all of a sudden you're going to look 10 times better. And it's just a patience game. And the big one for me in football, when I teach football, is weak foot. And it's such a funny little vibe. You just... This player rocks up and he's in the school football team and he plays outside of school and he plays for county or around, around my area where I teach QPR is the local QPR and Reading are the two sort of local academies. And they play for one of them and they rock up and it, they dominate in PE lessons. They absolutely dominate. And then you go, right, now use your weak foot. And all of a sudden it's just, it 
they're, they're still good. Like their movement's still brilliant and they still get on the ball a lot and they're still, you know, shouting and well, not shouting, they're 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 supporting their teammates and where to stand and tactically their break their football brains are fantastic. But like they they just their next three passes go skew if because all of a sudden they're using their left foot or their right foot. And I think for me to go back to the original question, depending on the kid, and I know I'm being very sit on the fence as well here, depending on the kids is when you tell them that the journey. So for me, I remember my current year tens when they're in year eight, we went to this county festival thing and we got to semi, what was unofficially the semi final. And we were something like three, two down with about four minutes to go. And an injury on the other team happened. So I had a chance to talk to my team. And I said, you know, all those times in training when I shouted really randomly, you've got you're seven nil down in the World Cup final and you've got three minutes to equalise. And they all went, yeah. I was like, what situation are we in now? And they all went, oh, yeah, we're one try down with four minutes to go. I was like, mm, yeah, brilliant. So at that, in that environment, it worked to tell them. Whereas other kids, you just leave it because you know that they're never going to, put two and two together and work out that you as a coach have made this environment for them but they don't need to and personally I don't I don't need them to work it out almost it doesn't benefit me but you just know that in that situation they'll be able to go back to the training paddock if you like um, um, and yeah and, and things like that and, and piece things together and and put themselves in that that almost pressure cooker on their own and I think with youth sport, which is where I spend a lot of my time, that you know, as a teacher, I, I never mention results before a game, half time or after a game. I never talk about the score. I never really talk about whether we're winning, losing, drawing, whatever. Because the boy I teach an all boys environment. I'm very aware I keep saying boys and young men. Um, but because the boys create their own hype around that. So they create their own hype about around the result. I, as a coach, don't need to. I just need to give them the tools to be able to manage their own game, whether they're 12 years old or 16 years old or 18 years old. They need to be able to manage their own game on their own around the scoreline. And if you can sprinkle that into training and have those small little one-to-one -one conversations, um, getting parents involved can be quite key. You know, I've, I've had parents come up to me and say, oh, my son keeps telling me that you make him use his weak foot. And I was like, well, yeah, because he's too. it's football. You need to be able to use two feet. And actually, when you when you explain it to the parent in that context, they kind of click a bit more. You know, you, you always get the sporty parents who played sport when they were younger, so they they kind of understand it. And I think for me, particularly in rugby, with the non, if the parents haven't played rugby themselves when they were younger, you know, they they just produce this kid who's very large and therefore suits a rugby environment. You know, and the kid goes home and he's gone, oh, Mr. Kilcoyne made me touch only again today. And it's, it's really frustrating. And it's like, right, I'm doing this for a reason. In three or four years' time, you'll thank me for this. And it's just about, um, yeah, creating that pathway and creating that journey. So in three or four years' time, your son isn't one of these players who gets to 14, 15. You know, all his mates have their growth spurt and then he drops out because he can't just run through everyone anymore. And I think that, that's some, I don't know if football has like an equivalent of that where the, the early developers, there's always this dropout rate because the early developers suddenly get caught up and then they're not the bee's knees anymore. And I, I don't know if football has an equivalent. I've personally not seen it quite as much. But yeah, and then so it, it that then that then covers every level that you're talking about. So you've covered the entry level kid who's going to go on and play on a Sunday morning with his mates. You've covered the mid level who might play semi pro. And then you've pushed the kid who could end up playing at a much higher level. It kind of leads me on to a question, really. Like, Michael, you talked about the Rocky Road earlier. What, what is it you guys do in the academy? I mean, there's been some good press around the kind of like the biobanding type stuff. How, how are you, can, you guys constructing the environment to, to overcome some of those kind of maturation challenges and those developmental challenges? Yeah, so, I mean, we've been really, really fortunate in terms of um, probably got ahead of the curve a little bit on terms of the bioband and stuff. And I'll, I'll signpost everyone at the end of this conversation to an individual who um, is really, really good in it. Um, she actually came on and had a conversation with, with us and with me around, around this, um, which is really good. But it, it works in a variety of ways. So one of the things academy teams do do now is we... Um, 
we, again, we will bio band teams. So we'll, if we're playing Reading at the weekend, for example, we'll say to you, right, rather than go in birth year or school year, so September through to August, bio band them. So then all of a sudden you end up with a under 12 playing in an under 14, technically 14s fixture, um, which is absolutely fine. <laughs> Um, because all of a sudden you see them all grouped together. And I think the biggest thing for us is challenging the individuals in terms of where they are in their current development and then what does it look like when you change it. So the, the big one for us is around, you know, you, you small Q3s, Q4s, all of a sudden when they start going from being an under 11 to under nine and uh, absolutely tearing it up, you're kind of going, oh, okay. Well, that's really interesting then, because actually when you put them, someone who's the same biological age as them, they're very, very good. Or you've got an individual who, you know, is a little bit quicker, a little bit stronger in his own age group. But when he plays against people who are actually relative to him, he doesn't show those and he doesn't have a plan B. So we do that quite regularly. We'll do that in training as well. Um, so we'll have nights where we'll do carousel sessions um, and we'll group them in their, their bio band and age groups and, allow them to work out of that which is really really good um, and we also for prolonged periods if necessary play people up or down or across or however you want to phrase it to give them exposure over a prolonged period of time um, and basically say to them listen we feel like at the moment you're relying too much on your strength so you're going to play up for you know eight weeks ten weeks and you're going to train and play up and allow you to experience what, what the game going to feel like when people do catch you up. Um, it, it is a bit of a minefield in, I'd say in football at the moment, because <clears throat> if you actually look at the quartiles of when Academy players are born, you've got a real heavy Q1, a little bit less Q2 and then Q3 and four are, are very low. And so we are, probably trying to do work on the recruitment side of looking to get different quartiles in um and you know th there can be simple things from speaking to Megan again which is if you've got a fixture or a training session which one of your recruitment staff's going to watch just number them one to 15 one to 20 um for a coach's perspective you might not tell the recruiter you're doing this one being your oldest 20 being your youngest and then all of a sudden it changes your perspective slightly because when you realise that, that number 17 is able to compete against your one, two and three, you're like, OK, well, maybe there's something there. Um, so there's probably a little bit of work we need to do on the talent ID side in football as an industry. Um, but it isn't just in the UK. If you look at abroad, we play teams abroad quite a lot. They've got exactly the same thing, but year of birth. They work from 2003, so January to December. We got... Uh, a, a team sheet a quartiles just out of curiosity not not that it made any difference um of a, a prominent italian team that we were playing and i think out of their 13 lads or whatever it was 10 of them were q1s so it's a prominent issue but it is something that we're trying to address and you will see more concerted efforts from academies now to look at how they can incorporate Q3s and Q4s and maybe look at the basic biomechanical skills of ABCs, ball manipulations, et cetera, and focus on those and then give them opportunities to play across age groups so we can see them against people who are physically the same as them. How do you, I don't know how much of the scouting, inverted commas, um, you're actually physically involved in standing on muddy pitches on a Sunday morning or whatever, but I find in rugby, I have some really interesting conversations where I'll spot a player, like I mentioned earlier, who quite clearly, without me having to look, is Q3 or Q4. You can just tell by size and development and whatever. Like, how have you ever sort of seen a player in your academy who you know is Q3 and Q4 and you've had to have that, almost the other parents, if you like, looking at this player going, what is he doing here? Because but you as the the expert know that give him three, four, five years of our time and our coaching and our access to whatever it is, he's going to come good. And it's more about not wrapping that Q3, Q4 kid up in cotton wool, but it's about, you know, just be patient. He's going to get a few kicks. He's going to be a bit slower. He's going to be, you know, 
shoulder barge off the ball a lot. But actually, you know, if we can protect him for now and stick him, say, right wing, give him four years, he's going to have his growth spurt and end up being our dominant holding midfielder who's, and then everyone's going to suddenly penny drop moment. No, I don't know. Is there, what's it like in, in academy football? Is it? Yeah, 100% there is that. Um, and there is a photo which I, I'll try and find whilst you guys are talking about your next bit, um, which we, we can show parents this um, and we can show them and say this is a really good example of um, what it looks like in people's journey. So we educate the parents quite a lot and, and we say to them, you know, these are all the contributing factors. It isn't just a performance thing now. We, every, every individual's got their own journey. And um, again, having that dialogue with parents is massive. I'd say another area that we we work on in this is training age. Um, so there'll be individuals like football's a very early specialization sport. You know, you have pre-academies that work with um, you know, under six, under seven, under eight players, which is years. So sorry, I was just trying to figure that out. So that's years one, two, and three. So they'll come into alongside their grassroots football, but they will come in that, uh, and then you can get signed from year four, which is under nine. So then you're a registration as a club. If you have an individual who then comes into your program at under 11s, that's potentially six years of training that they haven't had that some of the other boys have had. So you're then looking at it and going, well, what are our expectations for that individual? Because it can't be the same. You, you've got, you know, a boy that's going to come in that would have had maybe one or two training sessions a week from his dad and his best mate's dad, which is nothing wrong with that. But you'd hope that the sessions that paid coaches at professional clubs are putting on with the facilities they've got would provide them with better levels of support or challenge or whatever that might be compared to another boy who's been in our environment for six years and has had all those things so we we look at it on an individual basis and basically say you know what we're, we're comfortable that his training age at the moment with us is really low that's going to present us with different challenges he might technically not be up to scratch tactically he might be all over the place and look like he's running around but a headless chicken but you've got to be comfortable as a as a a club and as a culture, a school, whatever it is, to say, I think over the long term, there's potential and the strap line for Southampton is potential into excellence. So we're not looking for who's best now, as you said, we're looking for that potential, something that we can hopefully mould and get through into our, you know, our PDP phase, etc. So it, it's good that we've got signposts of it. Gareth Bale came through late, people like that having a signpost to say, yeah, we've seen this with that individual. Look how that changed. Look how he developed. Because we got the previous, it's a nice signpost through to people and say, yeah, this is what it looks like. Your journeys won't all be the same. I, you actually answered my next question there in, in the end, but you said, I, I was going to ask, like, how do we avoid it becoming a race to the bottom? Because the danger is you just try and find kids that are younger and younger and younger to, to give them that time in your environment and it, it just becomes a, a little bit of an issue. But I think the fact you said there, you, you know, you're looking for potential. I guess that's probably a whole other debate and I'm already conscious of time. So we, we probably won't do it this morning, but actually, you know, how do you judge potential? And I, from my um, experience, I do think it just comes down to experience. You know what I mean? If you see enough kids, you can start to just see the ones that maybe are quite comfortable being challenged quite regularly. So, um, yeah, no, I think that's a fascinating one. And, and maybe we'll get you get you back on another time to, to chat more about this because we could probably genuinely spend all day on this topic. I think it's, there's so many questions I've got for you on biobanding. It's ridiculous. But, um, yeah, no, uh, if we if we kind of park that one there for now and uh, David will jump over you to your uh, for your introduction. Oh, yeah. So I found um, during the week I was reading, I found it on Twitter, actually. Uh, Coach Logic had released an article which they'd done with Ealing Trailfinders, who are a championship uh, rugby club, but with a very, very uh, good academy set up. And they were talking about their performance analysis with their their young lads, and sort of 14 to 18-ish, um, and how they get the players hooked on it, because it's such a key tool now in every sport about watching clips of yourself back and you know watching the tactical game unfold and what have you. 
And actually, what they'd done is, from my understanding of it anyway, is they basically based their performance analysis on TikTok. So they narrowed everything down into a 10, 20 second clip, which the, the Generation Z or Z, whatever, kids can, can buy into. And then I, I, I read this, and then the next day I taught my year 10s, and I was, the, the lesson got a bit off track. I'll, but it happened and I was just talking to them about boys do you actually ever sit and watch 90 minutes of football and they were like no I was like well why not and they were like well we get bored sir like all I want to see is the goals and the big tackles and the good saves and the penalties and I was like fair and I was like and then I mentioned this article I watered it down for them and they were like well yeah that makes perfect sense like because you know, they're all teenagers I'll sit on their phones and watch the TikToks and I was like so not I've got about two rugby players in that particular class and I said if we could water down rugby for you for your generation to the best 10 minutes of the game are you more likely to sit and watch it on tv without getting up and looking at your phone or going to get a drink or whatever and they were like well yeah and it was just an interesting conversation so how can we make sport more accessible for the changing needs of the kids you know actually now have we because I can quite happily sit as a 27 year old, sit and watch 80 minutes of rugby or 90 minutes of football. But I'm inter- I watch different things now. So I watch rugby for the tactical stuff. I'm not really interested in the the wider aspects. And football is very, very similar. I, I, I prefer to watch why, why they've set up this way and why they're passing the ball like they are and why is so and so playing and why is, I don't know, why is this sub being made? Whereas for a teenager, for them to access getting into sport and then improving their own performance and all this sort of stuff, it needs to be literally 10 seconds, 20 seconds, go. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, go. But I think we've moved away now from the the minutes and hours of sitting in a room watching a game back because I just don't think kids will buy into it or young players will buy into it. And, it, you know, I then think about the, the, the senior side I play in. You know, I'm 27, I'll sit and watch... I would sit and re-watch our game on a Saturday, whereas I know the lads who just come out of the Colts or the under-18s won't because they have no interest in re-watching the whole 80 minutes. They need to see the the 10 seconds, the 20 seconds, the 30 seconds where something is positive or negative has happened. Do you think there's a danger here that we pander to, to certain individuals? And, and I get it, like, if that's that becomes their routine, I've got no major issue in saying, you know, my, my skill as a coach around analysis has to be creating the most succinct message possible. As you say, like no one wants to sit inside for an hour and do an analysis session. I I think those days are gone, but I I do often wonder, is it part of our job to be challenging those, that generation or those individuals to go, well, actually, maybe you need to watch the game in a different light. Maybe you need to have some questions that you're going to kind of try and answer throughout the game and and challenge yourself to watch more. Because I I just wondered, like, it's a very slippery slope (laughs) in the next generation are just going to be like, well, I'm, I'm just not going to do analysis. Do you know, it, like you just get so short that actually it's, maybe it's impossible to, to get messages across. So is it our job to stretch them at the other end of the boundary and say, you need to be watching more? Because we, we definitely have the same issue at, at Oxford Uni. Like the girls just, they're not rugby fans. They, they won't sit and watch a game because they enjoy the game. They'll sit and watch something because it's effectively, you know, inverted commas, homework, and they've been asked to do it and bring it, bring in some thoughts and some reflections. But I, I do think it has a huge impact on game understanding for, for anybody if you don't engage in the game. And that's not to say that everything you watch on TV is, is great. Like, I think you've got to be quite critical of, of what you're watching and how it translates to you. But I, I just say, I wonder whether, how much of it is our job is to stretch both ends of the, of the spectrum. I do get it. Um... And I'm inclined to agree, but then I went home and thought about it afterwards. And it was like, you know, who are we actually doing the analysis for? Are we doing it for us? Are we doing it for the players? And I think it's really easy. And it's one of my really weird and national fears that I've become one of these old school coaches that just because I did it this way 10 years ago is how I'm going to do it for the rest of my coaching career. The generations will change. And I've heard, I've read articles, um, interviews and stuff that Eddie Jones has done. You know, and he said, actually, you know, if you stuck a Generation Z player, let's name Marcus Smith, I don't know the guy, but let's name him for sake of example, 20-year-old fly half at Harlequins, you know, probably going to go on and have a really good rugby career. If we sit there and try and badger him 
to act like how we as a coach think he should be acting? Are we going to crush that talent? Because he's quite a, he's watched the way Mark Smith plays. He's quite a maverick. Like he, it looks like he's just making up as he goes along. I'm sure he isn't. But like, you know, are we going to crush that mentality of like a flair player almost? And I was, I was watching something the other week about football. It was about Ronaldinho actually and how Ronaldinho was arguably the last genuine flair player in football. And then since then, it's just been killed out because we, or football, has developed a system where it has to be pass, 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 pass. Everyone knows what they're doing every minute of every game. You know, and are we in danger of killing almost that entertainment factor of sport? I know, well, I've gone quite a tangent there. But, like, in every sport, like, are we in danger of killing off the Rolodinos, the Marcus Smiths, the Jason Robinsons, who could just get a ball and everyone in the stadium suddenly switched on? So I bet if I showed my year 10s clips of Rolodinho, they'd watch it all day because he was such an entertainer. And he was very, very good at what he did. You know, if I showed my year 10s clips of Marcus Smith, they'd sit and watch him all day. Whereas if you look at a more conventional player who just gets the ball and distributes, say Romeo in the Southampton team, occasionally makes a massive tackle and everyone goes, ooh. But, you know, with all due respect to him, I'm not paying 60 quid to watch Romeo play. I'll pay 60 quid to watch teleplay and Redmond and all those other sorts of players but I'm not paying 60 quid to watch 11 Romeo's running around the football pitch I, I wonder if that's also about intent do you know you know if if the intent on our part is to say you need to develop your tactical understanding you can't develop tactical understanding if you only watch five minutes of 80 minutes if, if you want to watch highlights and you want to watch skills like awesome no one's saying don't do that I don't think but I, I do wonder about is that how we frame the purpose of analysis for them to be able to go, okay, well, like, how do you get out of your own 22 or how do you play out for the back in football? Like, that's, that's about all the knowledge I've got of football. So, um, you know what I mean? It's, it's one of those where you're kind of just maybe trying to steer them in a, in a different direction as opposed to just letting them get away with or just stick with what they're comfortable. Um, Michael, what does that look like for you guys in your environment? How much time would they kind of spend on self-analysis? Is that part of the IDP? Yeah, so I mean, we're really fortunate. We have a platform called Huddle, um, which obviously videos the games and then the lads can go back and clip. So they they will, at younger age groups, have an IDP focus. It might be weak foot, might be driving out from the back, whatever that would be. Um, and then it would be kind of within their remit to over a weekend to try and clip some examples of where they think they did that well, where they did that maybe not so well and need to improve on it and why. Um so the IDP is, is important for a level of self-awareness, which, you know, we, we think is important for them to understand where they are and why they are where they are. Um, interestingly, I've had thoughts about this area for a while. Like you look at maybe your American football's example, and they seem to go the other way where it is like death by analysis because a quarterback sitting there at four o'clock in the morning till practice at 10 doing analysis and I'm trying to figure out well if they're saying your top ones are doing it your Brady's your Manning's and they they're able to regurgitate pictures etc is there something there or is that just a culture that we think there's something there and actually Tom Brady would naturally be very good because he's able to do that he's able to throw the ball quicker than everyone else he's able to identify pictures because he's 40 years old and has played the last 17 years and in, in is he able to do that um so yeah, it's a really interest interesting point i think the big thing for me is that yeah i don't think many kids will watch sit down and watch 80 minutes of rugby or 90 minutes of football so if we are going to sculpture it to maybe slightly less in terms of um content can we be skillful in what minutes they're watching so if we're going to highlight it, maybe it's highlights where they can get two in one. Um, one of the things I used to like to do before we actually had huddle and we just had footage was I would just leave them a message on their match diaries of a timestamp. So it might be 1734 and say no more than that. And then they'd come back to me and tell me why I've chosen that minute. So why is it that I've chosen 1734? or I'd give them a block of time over this period. Why have I done it? So it's getting them to analyze the game and they'd probably have to watch it a few times and they'd have to look at the context around it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting cycle because I think culturally, whatever sport you're in, it changes how you view analysis and how you 
do it and who leads it and all that type of stuff so i think it's going to be a work in progress it'll be yeah i'm, I'm really interested to see where it goes because i think like with you've got set piece coaches in football now and they're doing loads of work with analysis and pet does loads of work with it so that means every man and his dog's going to want you now so i'll be really interested to see how this develops over the next 10 years but i can see it as you said there david being more and more of an issue of kids want quick access instagram style videos one minute done one minute done rather than we're going to sit here for 20 25 minutes breaking down how you've pivoted off the wrong foot there i think that's probably where huddle and coach logic certainly coach logic i've, I've seen more of their kind of platform have done a really good job in, in just reframing that analysis piece to the player do you know what i mean it's very much player focus the player does their own analysis rather than and i think there's still a place for an analyst to be producing a load of stuff that's useful for the coaches but i i would definitely say i guess maybe outside of the pro levels the the days of somebody sat clip into one two in the morning for a community club because actually you're just looking at it as you say like how much time and effort goes into that and then you look at the stats on youtube or wherever it is you post it even on coach logic and huddle I look at the, the player views of some of the stuff I'll have spent an hour trying to kind of create, and it might only be 15 minutes worth of video, but, you know, they've watched it for four minutes and you're just like, well, okay, I need, I need to find a better way. I think, I think just them, them understanding they're being looked at and being tracked a little bit, but also me then being able to go, like, clearly that's just good data to go, yeah, great. Well, none of these guys are watching more than seven minutes. So I now know what my window is for analysis I'm going to do but put it back on them. You guys come back to me with your own clips. That's, I think that's, that's definitely a shift I've seen in that, in that logic. Um, David, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I, I was kind of going to echo the same point. Is that how we got to the point where, you know, we need to give the players the ownership of it. You know, I'm not saying we get rid of analysis. I've got a mate who does analysis and I'd hate for him to lose his job, but like he, um, you no, know, he very much does this as well. I remember when he first got his job, he works in Wales for um, Cardiff Blues or Cardiff Rugby Club as they are now. And, um, yeah, he used to do that. The, the Blues Academy or whatever would play on the Saturday. He'd stay up all Saturday night, clip it, ready for the coaches on Sunday. But actually now what he's saying is he, he's got his KPIs, key performance indicators, that he needs to look for because it's what the coaches are interested in. So he almost basically just produces stats at this stage and the players themselves have to go and find were they kicking with their weak foot? Was the 10 stood flat enough? How many rucks did I hit as a seven or whatever it is? And I think that's where, to go back to a point you originally made, Phil, you know, are the players starting to pick up their tactical understanding of the game from taking ownership of it? You know, is coaching changing in the sense that, yes, we need to give them the foundations of tactical information, but actually if the players go looking for it themselves and take ownership of learning the tactical side of the game, and you as a coach using your coaching philosophy and principles inject almost a style of play, are you going to get more success because the players care about it? You know, if you end up with a bit of a maverick who doesn't really care, you then just manage that individual differently. And then that come, that boils down to your man management sort of skills then. I, I think that also might loop back um, to the point we talked about earlier. Like, actually, is that an effort thing? Like should we be praising effort that you've spent on your personal analysis and being aware that maybe there'll be some players that, that don't want to go looking at clips because they're not happy with their performance and, and them just being more and more comfortable going, I, you know, I've got to look at something that I, I might not be happy with to learn how I make that better. And, and, you know, I think that's where the IVP for me is, is just worth its weight in gold. If it's linking with, if you're invested in your IDP, and, you know, there's a load of theories you can kind of follow for, for why they're important in terms of motivation and those types of things and goal setting. If it links to your goals and you're intrinsically motivated to achieve that, it just becomes another kind of layer within that process, I think. And, and maybe that's the key. Maybe we need to be better as coaches in a general sense of layering stuff in so it, it feels less like randomly allocated tasks. And actually, it's specific stuff where you're saying, great, look at the clips update your IDP, feedback to me. Do you know what I mean? It becomes this kind of continuous loop of, of improvement and development as we kind of touched on at the beginning, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent, but then bring it back around. Um, so I know Netflix, for example, their data comes back and says no one watches, uh, well, the majority of series 
people don't watch past 28 minutes. So even if there's hour long episodes, normally people break it up into two segments or comedy specials is around 28 minutes. So I think that shows you even at the top level, the consumption is you've got about half an hour to engage someone. And no, I know listening to comedians talk on different avenues uh, and platforms, etc. They say what they do, they put what used to be their closer at the start to hopefully engage people to keep them in, engaged so I think it does show you that it isn't just a, a sport thing in, in culture it is you know quickly consumed uh, now bringing it back round um, one of the things from being on my A license and completing that which England do which I thought was brilliant was around um, they get the players to identify themselves at set pieces um, so trying to make set pieces more fun because in, in football it's not fun at all um, so they would have different descriptors like first contactor or deliverer or blocker or whatever they would be. And then before they came in for a camp, they would tell them and rank where they thought they would be most suited out of these five different positions. Um, and then they would look to then change that into clips. So when we're looking at set piece setups and we've got five blockers or seven first contacts is what it would be they then sculpt uh, the set piece work relative to that so I thought that was a really nice way of actually if we're asking players to go and engage with analysis set piece work like that might be a really easy way to do it so you might be able to say okay you're a deliverer so you tell me with the selection of players we've got what type of deliveries are going to cause most uh, challenge for the opposition so here's your areas where goals are generally scored. Here's the statistics to prove that. Can you go and find me some clips at the pro game where people who have got a lot of first contactors score goals? Then you're challenging them to go away and look at your Liverpools, your Chelsea's, your whoever, watch the game and bring it back to you so they're engaged within that process. And I thought that was a really nice way of getting them to engage with analysis probably without them even realizing and that would be prolonged to go and find that data so it's not just one clip that would take you a couple of hours but they're watching a lot of a lot of footage just relative specifically to them I love that it, it just made my mind drift towards the the kind of the phrase in ecological dynamics of repetition without repetition that that's analysis without analysis isn't it you're just you're actually engaging them in the process and as you say, I think, I think if you can hook players into loving what they're looking for and loving the information it gives them, then actually they're, they're just going to kind of keep running with it and, and it will become a, a key kind of part of their process, I guess. So, oh, fantastic. Um, guys, yeah, I'm, again, I'm, I'm conscious of your time. So um, I think we'll kind of park that there. Again, it's probably another one we could, we could talk about all afternoon. But um, just before we kind of round up, have you got uh, recommendations for anything else for people to kind of check out any other nudges towards uh, content? And Michael, I know you said you're going to name check your your colleague that's doing some great work at Southampton as well. Yeah, perfect. So I'm going to go for a couple. So uh, the first one is an individual called Megan Hill. Now, Megan um, works for the FA now. Um, she does a lot of stuff um, and has done a PhD around bio banding and maturation um, and has loads of really interesting content around that and how um, it can be better utilized and how, you know, it can challenge maybe some conventional working so I, I definitely recommend that i'd also re uh, recommend and again i'm going to butcher a name here a guy called gear jordé uh which is g-e-i-r-j-o-r-d-e-t now he is a psychological researcher football psychological researcher and does a lot of work around scanning in football um and in terms of um some of the psychological factors he looked at the n amount of time taken at penalties and how that affects whether you score or miss so those two have been really informative and phil if you don't mind i'm going to give myself a quick plug here um so i also host a podcast called the sports initiative podcast um we have a really wide ranging uh guests come on not just football from a rugby context. I've had Russell Earnshaw on, um, Toby Booth, uh, Kevin Bowring, um, as, as well as there's many more to come. So yeah, if uh, anyone would like to check that out, as I said, really wide range of guests, really wide range of topics. And if you can put up with hearing my boring voice, yeah, come and check it out. 
Oh man, some great recommendations. Um, as always, all the links will go in the uh, in the blurb for people so they can find those easily. Um, I'm big big fan of self promotion. That's that's basically just yeah. What it's like the BBC. You just get people on to promote the stuff they're doing. It, it, it works. So uh, David finishes off. Yeah, uh, a second plug. Um, Rusty and Fletch are probably two of my heroes when it comes to coaching. So any anything they've done get yourself involved. Um, they run the Magic Academy. They do their own podcasts and stuff like that. Um, a book I'm reading at the moment and something that ties into my sort of personal targets as a teacher and a coach um, is a book called Good Video Games and Good Learning by a man called James Paul Gee. And he's basically looking at how video games in the last five, 10 years have become so addictive for young teenagers, boys and girls and how we can transfer the techniques they use into our coaching and our teaching to get the hook, to get them interested, to give them those sprinklings of success early, to drop the challenge in, and how we can swap things around, how we can level up sessions and things like that. It's a really interesting read. Um, shamefully, it's been sat on my bookshelf for far too long, and I finally got around to reading it. But it's a really interesting read, and I'm really, really enjoying it. Top man, thank you very much. Appreciate those. Um, guys, I've really enjoyed this. As I said, like, yeah, just just nowhere near enough time, unfortunately, because I think we got into some really, really fascinating topics. But uh, appreciate you both coming on. Uh, I'll round up the roundup. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks again to the guys for coming on and contributing to a really great discussion. As always, links to the content we discussed are available in the blurb on Rugby Coach Weekly. I'd like to thank you for listening. Wish you all the best and go well. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.